I'm from Homa. Grew up in Thibodeau. Born in Thibodeau, grew up in Homa. Now they're almost one, you know. We go back and forth like we go down the street now. It's just really amazing. And um, my parish, which has pretty much been my parish uh, the whole time, <laughs> is St. Francis de Sales Cathedral right downtown in Homa. Kind of grew up downtown and hung out, and that's where we ended up there and been there most of my life, still there, where I am. I've pulled back from a number of things that I've been involved with over the years to do more of this because this is so critical in the times we're in right now so that each, each person uh, will understand the seriousness and the importance of the Eucharist, which is, as Catholics, we all believe is not a symbol. It's body, blood, soul, and divinity. True, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Um, went to Nichols, finished in agriculture, farmed, for a number of years, and that led me to all kind of stuff. And I'm going to tell you just a little brief about what happened to me to change my life. Because I might say some, I don't know fully exactly what I'm going to say here today. There's so much I could take up the whole weekend. So I asked the Holy Spirit to please lead me to let me know what you need to hear. And, and so, uh, but in order to prepare you, you have to understand where I came from. A little bit of my testimony uh, would be useful, I think, because I may say a couple things here today that appear to be radical. I am not a radical type person. I really am not. But when God says do something, clearly, uh, I'm going to do what it, that's how I was in the business world. And that's how I am. That's the way I'm wired. And so when I need, and I know it's right, and I need to do it, I will go out. There'll be no limit that I won't risk doing what needs to be done. And so I was just using it wrongly before my conversion. So real quickly, because I don't want to spend too much time on that. I, uh, like I said, I was in agriculture, then drifted on over to oil and gas, had an oil and gas company with some people, drilled a number of wells. In fact, one of the agriculture entities, we had a bunch of canal systems around here. I used to come out here a lot. And um, mostly farmed sugar cane, soybeans, wheat, mostly sugar cane. But that turned, I don't know if any of y'all ever did that, but you know that can easily turn into uh, like a seven-day-a-week job, and it did for me. I was up when at the largest I ever farmed directly for the company I worked for was 6,000 acres of sugarcane. And I can I promise you that will turn into a seven day a week deal, 24 hours a day, the phone doesn't quit ringing. Went right on in there into the oil and gas. I love operating stuff, so I went right on into oil and gas and same kind of thing. And I had a bad habit of never letting anything go because I was so afraid of what if this doesn't work and I'm, I, had two, I had two daughters, I still got two daughters, I still have a family, thanks to my wife, she held my family together while I participated in becoming what was an extreme workaholic. I would work, it was not unusual, and some of you may know people, maybe you are someone like that, I work, I work 90 hours a week. Sometimes I'd go without even shutting it down for the whole day right into the next day. It was out of control. Real estate, oil and gas, sugar cane, had a candle company in Mobile. I mean, just crazy. Always looking for something else to do. And, uh, and money was never my driving force. I made mean, a living doing all this craziness. But it was always what I enjoyed was seeing a project come to its completion and be successful. And that is the way I live my life. I'd, be, I'd get home on a Saturday morning, a rare Saturday morning, where I'd be home, and I'd be by 10 o'clock in the morning, show you how sick all this was. I'd be at that window right there looking out. I just couldn't stay in the house. Had to be doing something. And... Uh, that's how I lived my life uh, from college all the way to 43 years old. And then, and then I had some things going on in all my businesses that were not good. 
federal grand jury investigation, stuff like that, which I wasn't a part of, but some of my partners were, and that I couldn't become involved in all that. I wouldn't do it. So I found myself having to start over again. FBI were all over the place. <laughs> it was bad time. And I knew I was going to have to start over again after 21 years of uh, night and day, night and day. And the last thing I remember in, that I remember in my, what I call my previous life was I was sitting on the sofa in the den of my house and a Sunday, March the 1st, 1992, about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I was reconfiguring all how I was going to restructure all my businesses that I was involved in with these people who were under investigation. Fortunately, I left and uh, before all that went down, but I left angry because I had to give up so much. Of my, I, look, I've given my life to all this. And the last thing I remember saying was, next time, this time, I am not going to have any partners. This time, it's going to be for me. No partners, it's going to be me. When I said that, the next thing I experienced was I was in a fog. Now, I know you, like during this time of the year when we burn sugar cane and it gets foggy, I don't know if it gets like that over here. I'm sure it does. You can't even hardly see the middle of the road. And it gets, and we'd have all that smoke in the road and, you know, in the air. And you could, it would get, you know, there's a fear that comes over you where you really don't know where you are in that road. And I cross the center, you can't even see the center line. So you don't know if anybody's in front of you, cane trucks, trucks behind you, whatever. You, you got this feeling of great fear. What do I do? You can't just stop. There may be somebody behind you. But that's, that's that fear. All of a sudden, I was in that place. But it was a thousand times worse than what I'm trying to describe to you by that. Because where I was, I put myself in a place that I was lost. Absolutely alone, hopelessly lost in this fog. And I, I knew I had put myself in there by the things I had done. Because when, I, when you work like I worked, you didn't care much about, you know, you really didn't give people the dignity that they were supposed to have. Family, associates, you just, the project was most important. And, that, and, and whatever it cost, it cost. And um, I knew that based on making those decisions, I put myself there. I was totally lost. I could hear my wife and my two girls on the other side, which it didn't seem like far, but I knew it was hopelessly far because I could never, ever, ever be with them again because of what my decisions. It's called compunction, where you actually feel the pain of the sins, not only on yourself, but what you've done to other people. What I did to other people was horrific. And I uh, hadn't been to church. I was away from the church. And that was my own fault, because I had couldn't go to confession anymore, because I had it a thought in my mind that confession just didn't work for me. Because I'd go to confession and I'd go out and commit the same sins. So this definitely isn't for me. Well, that's right where God, Satan wanted me for sure. Because I began to basically set up my own little church that I could pretty much justify anything. That had been years and years and years. And once you quit going, I found, I know now after so many years, once you separate yourself from the sacraments like confession, then you get out on your own where you are and there is a devil. I can tell you many, many, many stories about all that over the last 30 years. But he, he's getting you right where he wanted me and or you or wherever. He, he gets us there. And then all of a sudden, we're on our own, isolated. And we're easy pickings for someone, for a creature that is so intelligent. 
were easy pickings, and that's where I was. And so here I was, all those choices had put me there, and all of a sudden I'm back on the sofa again in my den. And uh, my heart was about ready to come out my chest. I was nauseated. I was sweating. Sick. Weak. Close to passing out. And I said just to myself, like just right off the top, man, what was that? Never thinking that I would hear a voice tell me, a man's voice say so clearly, like you hear me, broke through and said, unless you change your ways and follow me, that is how you will spend eternity. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I was never real good in school. I'm no scholar. I was an ag, and an ag guy, kind of, you know, we just kind of hopefully make it through. But we, once you get something, and once you grab onto it, you got it. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I got that. That was 30 years ago, and when I tell you the story today, I still get goose pimples because I think how awful it was. It was a life changer for me because it was so horrible that I didn't want another second of it, much less eternity, eternity. And so that has pushed me for the last 30 years to talk about many things. Blessed Mother, and because I'm sure today she's the one that sent her son to come see me one more time. I had an earlier experience early in my life that I walked away from. Oh my gosh, I think about that at times. Walked away from our lady. Can you imagine how arrogant? But I think she said, look, he's got a job to do. And I think she told her son, just like she did when she had that wine at Cana, she told him, you know, do what you've got to do to get his attention, and let's see what he does. Well, what he did was he pulled himself away from me. So in essence, whatever you're experiencing in your life right now that you may think is bad, I'm not saying it's not bad. We all i got bad stuff right now I'm dealing with. But without God, you have no idea what bad is. At least I got to see that. And so that has driven me with the same enthusiasm that I used to work. Every time I get a little slack and, and feel like I'm wearing down, which I'm getting older, you know, next birthday going to be 75 years old. So if anything, I got some experience to talk about. Every time I get a little slack, I start thinking about where he brought me, where I was brought for just an instant. And I can't even comprehend that for eternity. It's awful. I went many, many years without understanding what that was until I found a description of it. And uh, I'll, I'm going to read it, and then we'll move on to talk about the Eucharist. Cause, but you have to know where I come from. Because once I get my eye on something, I don't take it off. And that's a farming principle, too, which I'll tell you about in a little while. This is a very short writing from a little nun who lived around 19... 1935, during, right before World War II hit Poland. She never went to school for any, she tried, but she never went far. But her name is St. Faustina. Anybody ever heard of her? St. Faustina. And she had no education, but she wrote this big old book about this big that God dictated. She was his little secretary. And there's a paragraph in here that described, when I read this paragraph, I heard on Catholic radio first, and I went, whoa, that's what I experienced. And so when I got, got, got home, I opened the book. I had never seen that paragraph. It's, if you ever like to read it yourself, it's 741. 
And this is what she describes. God took her and showed her, showed her hell. Today I was led by an angel to the chasms of hell. It is a place of great torture. How awesomely large and extensive it is. The kinds of tortures I saw. The first torture that constitutes hell is the loss of God. The second is loss of God. The second is perpetual remorse of conscience. In other words, you, you're dealing perpetually for what you've done forever for what you've done in time. Just this little snippet that we're in time. The third is that one's condition will never change. That's what I experienced to level three, torture three. I've often asked the Lord before I found this, was that hell? He said, oh, not all of hell. And you say, how do you say that? It's an inside thing. You receive it, but you have to open yourself up to it. He's talking to us all the time. You just got to be open to it. No, you didn't see all of it. Because if you'd have seen all of it, then you'd have seen, you'd have been with creatures that I created that hate me as much as you hate me. Well, why didn't you bring me there? That was my next question. He says, because I'd have brought you there, you'd have died. And I can kind of believe that. Because when I came back on that sofa, wow. Now let's get into that. The fourth is the fire that will penetrate the soul without destroying it. A terrible suffering, since it is purely a spiritual fire lit by God's anger. The fifth torture is continual darkness and a terrible suffocating smell. And despite the darkness, the devils and the souls of the damned see each other and all the evil both of others and their own. The sixth torture is the constant company of Satan. The seventh torture is horrible despair, hatred of God's vow words, hatred of God, vow words, curses, and blasphemy. These are the tortures suffered by all the damned together. But if that is not the end of the sufferings. There are special tortures destined for particular souls. These are the torment of the senses. Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. There are caverns and pits of torture where one form of agony differs from another. I would have died at the very sight of these tortures if the omnipotence of God had not supported me. Let the sinner know that he will be tortured throughout all eternity in those senses which he made use of to sin. I'm writing this at the command of God so that no soul may find an excuse by saying there is no hell or that nobody has ever been there and so no one can say what it is like. When I found that and answered the great fear that fell upon me at the time it happened and that has directed me now for over 30 years. I have no formal teaching in any of this, so you have, to, you have to understand where I come from because I have to say it even without formal teaching. We all have to say it. We don't need formal teaching. We're all called to go out and do what we are being called by God to do. The world today, run by Satan, is trying to direct us from that. And the first step is so that we don't believe in Satan. If we don't believe in him, then, you know, the rest is, we don't believe him in the first place. Then the rest is easy. So I guess I'm here to say, number one, the devil is real. God has already conquered the devil. In time, though, he expects for us to do our role in that ultimate final conclusion that will be sometime in the future, maybe tomorrow, maybe next month, maybe in a hundred years. We don't know that. 
That's not for us to know. Because whether God comes to see us or not, we're, get, we're fixing to see him, each one of us individually. We're going to have eyeball-to-eyeball content, contact with him. And what we're going to bring before him, what we're going to bring to him, to offer up to him, is our time in time. And we're going to cross over into eternity and we're going to bring that baggage with us. But lo, thank the Lord, underneath the cross, his precious blood fell. And if we get underneath that cross and that precious blood falls upon us, the debt that we could not pay has been paid. It's been paid in full. We could not have paid it. Jesus paid it. And he left a church on the face of the earth today, 2,000 plus years old, traveling on the face of the earth today to be in his presence. You know who that church is? Us. We've already had the church triumphant. I don't know if you've caught, I've been, spoke about that, but that's the church that's in heaven now. We have the church suffering. They are in the graveyards in purgatory. You see Signs of purgatory, preparing to be part of the church, triumphant. But there's a third part of the church, and that's called the church militant. Militant, military. This is spiritual warfare, and the task of the church calls us the church militant. Because it's spiritual warfare, truly. The church constantly trying to be tore apart by the devil. Now, individually here, myself, and I almost succumbed to it. Oh, my gosh, so close. If he wouldn't have done that to me, I don't know where my, me or my family would be today. But, but the thing that's of most prized to the devil is our families and our children. Our children. Now, how do we fight something as strong as the devil? Well, the church has given us the sacraments. Huh? And a beautiful sacrament. They're all beautiful. Baptism brings us into the church, but I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about the Eucharist. Jesus, truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in that little host that is like, we don't believe it. The church doesn't believe it. The average church does not believe, does not have the faith. You're going to hear Father talk about faith today. We got to have the faith. Do we have the faith to believe that behind that what appears to be a, this piece of bread is truly Jesus? Well, fortunately for us, fortunately for us, over the years, he's given us what we call Eucharistic miracles to show us, actually physically, that is really me. There are a whole set of cro- uh, have, have, have bled blood. Maybe some of y'all have seen that. Whole set have turned the flesh, heart tissue. Some as much as 1,200 years old. And it's as live today as it's live, y'all. Live. That's the God I want to work for. That's the God that we want to serve. Those are Eucharistic miracles. Now, why would God do that? Because he knows. He's lived on earth. He lived with us for 33 years. He knew the temptations. He knew what the devil could do. He knows what others can do. He knows how weak we are. And so he's given us these signs, such as Eucharistic miracles, to make sure that those are the opportunities for us to lift our faith up. Those are concrete tangible things so that when we look at that Eucharist at Mass, when we look at that Eucharist, we can say, I don't understand it. I can't explain it, Jesus, but I know that behind that little white appearance of bread, you are present. And you know what? I remember over hundreds and hundreds of years, and some even going on today, you have left proof that that is you. So I... Through my faith in you, I believe. I believe that's really you.
Now, when we can make that statement, and dare we make that statement, we got another problem facing us. Because if we really, and look, that faced me. That's one of the reasons why I left, I drifted from the church was because I knew that I had been taught that when I went to communion, I had to go where to first, confession, because I was sinful. So when I, fin when I quit going to confession, I knew that I really couldn't go to communion. I was, sin I was a sinner, and I wasn't confessing it. Confession, quote, quote, didn't work for me. Oh, how silly I was. It wasn't about me. I was so used to making things work, business. I was so used to making things work that I said, this has nothing to do with making me, making confession work for me. It's grace. And that, that ignorance kept me away from the confessional and therefore kept me away from, once I quit going to con communion, then it was easy to say, well, if I'm not going to go to communion, then I'm not going to go to church. And once I stopped going to church, then I had my own little church. I could minister to myself. Again, that's the devil that plays with our minds like that. And I was right there. Wouldn't have been for this experience, probably be dead. Had many opportunities to be dead through farming and all. Believe me, dead. Dead and experiencing right what I experienced for eternity. Thank God for his mercy. And so, I owe big time for that mercy. I owe my time for what I got left in time to explain that and to try to describe that. And so, what do we have there? We have confession, which is a sacrament that prepares us properly to receive communion. You do not want to receive communion in the state of sin. But you don't want to not receive communion. So what do you do? you got to go get ready for communion. Hard step, I understand it. Hard for me after 21 years that I had to go... But, you know, after I experienced, tell you a little story about that. The day that happened, March 1st of 1992, I could not even sleep that night because all the games I had played with myself about confession, all those silly mind games about it, that was gone. Next morning, I was banging. We had 6.30 mass at the church. I was banging on that door, let me in because I, I couldn't sleep that night because I didn't want to die in that state of sin. And that priest opened the door. He's passed away now. He eventually became a bishop. Opened the door, and that's the eye was the first thing he saw on that Monday morning. <laughs> and I was there. I, I can sure he sat in that confessional and listened to that and said, oh my gosh, what a way to start the week. I mean, I began to lay out upon him 21 years. And let me just tell you this about, because confession is so tied to the Eucharist. Let me just tell this. When you go and you make that first challenge, it's tough. But you go in and you humble yourself. Father's not sitting in there as him. He's sitting in there as Jesus. They go to confession too. They're just men. But there are certain times in their vocation that they take on that role at the Eucharist, at Mass, and at confessional. You're conf he's there representing Jesus. And so, you got to humble yourself, and you get in there and you start. And I'm going to tell you what, I'm still working. Uh, in other words, the more you go, 30 years, the more you go, the more comes up. It's a beautiful sacrament of healing that prepares us for the Eucharist. And so... Let's say, okay, uh, so let's say you, the Holy Spirit inspires you and he gives you the courage to go in there and tell the priest as best as you can your sins. Clean. You are clean. Guess what you're ready for? Receive Jesus. Truly, truly Jesus. Now, when that happens, then you can actually see the presence working on you. Because you know what's going to happen then? You're going to have to go back to confession. 
because all of a sudden things are going to come up that you are not satisfied holding in you anymore. So you get that back in that box again and you do it again. And then you go out and receive communion. You see the relationship there. It's a preparer to receive Jesus. Why is that important? Have y'all looked around in the world today at all and seen what's going on in this world? Cannot you? Look, left is not even left anymore. Right and left is all mixed up. Up and down is black is not white. White is not black. Don't you see it? If you... If you don't see it, then you need to open your eyes. And the best way to open your eyes is from confession and the Eucharist. The world is upside down. What can you believe and trust in out there anymore? Really? Who? Jesus. Jesus. He's the only one you can really trust. Everybody else in this room, including me, will let each other down at some point. It gets hot enough where we let each other down. Different degrees, but at some point, we, we fall. Only Jesus can solve that. And he's present for us Catholics in the Eucharist. So if you want to be sincere, if we want to be sincere about who we are, in Christ, in our lives, in the world, to our kids, to our grand, ultimate grand. We, we, if we want to be sincere, I want to throw this at you. Sincere comes from two Latin words. Sine cheris, without wax. So when you write sincerely at the bottom of a letter, what you're writing at the bottom of the letter is without wax. What's, what's about that? Well, back when they made pottery in Jesus' times, they made two types of pottery. They made the pottery correctly when they would heat it and they would cool it. And it was, it was right, it was perfect. If they made it too fast, if they go from too hot to cooling too fast, it would crack. And so the potter, in order to get a good price, for his cheap pots would take wax and fill in all the cracks. And then he would paint all the pots. And on the shelf, they would all look the same. So let's say you were going in there and you would buy a pot. And if you knew anything about buying that and what they would do, you'd say, after you got a price, is it, well, I want to make sure though, is it sine cheris? Because I'm paying you top dollar for that pot. I want to know if it's sine cheris, without wax. And he would say, oh, of course. You know, most of them would say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. He said, well, let me just test it. Take it off the shelf and put it in the oven. Put it in the heat of the oven for a little while. Well, we all know what's going to happen in there. That wax melts. And what shows up? all the flaws, the imperfections, the cracks. Take that same thinking and say to us, what do we fill our imperfections with? Huh? Stuff? Whatever. I, I work a lot with addictions, with the guys with addictions, and I can tell you, those cracks and flaws are filled, I'm not excluding myself, with stuff. And what happens if you fill it with anything else other than God? When you get out, when you walk out that door, and you get back in your vehicles, go home, after church, you do whatever, you go, I guarantee you that's a spiritual oven out there. And the heat is being turned up, y'all. The heat is being turned up. And the real question is, what have you filled, what have I filled, my flaws, my imperfections with stuff of the world or God. Because that's the only way you're going to stand in there for your kids as, they, as kids are tried, stripped away, whether it be the drugs, the alcohol. They go, the devil will strip the kids from you. I was in, I'm not going to tell you which parish, but it was on the side of Lafayette Friday. 
talking about this sort of thing. It shocked me, some of the stuff I heard. Near Iberia, our area, down the bias. Horrible. So how do we stand up against that darkness and that evil? By filling those perfections with God. There is no better place than the Holy Mass, properly received from confession, but in between Masses, we have something we can do as Catholics. If you are so blessed to have in this parish, if you understand the battle as being part of the church militant, if you truly understand who you're fighting, then you understand the value of in this parish, you have an adoration chapel. You have an, so what is that? That's where you can go and spend some time with Jesus in between masses. Nothing's more important than a mass. That's the highest form of worship. But in between, how many times you drive in front of this place here and Inside of there, there's an opportunity for you to sit five minutes, ten minutes, an hour with Jesus. There's an opportunity. Now, you think he's not going to change you for what you're dealing with outside? He changed me. I was so awful. He changed me. He come got me and changed me. And as I go around working on chapels and all, I see the changes in people when we just step toward him in faith. We're all sinners. And if we, unless we step toward him in faith, we are not going to be changed by anything but the world. And it's like trying to walk up an escalator going down. Ever tried that? As soon as you stop, you're going down. He's trying to pull us down. So walk that escalator up. Don't stop. And so in between masses, we need boosters. You talk about boosters? We got a booster. We have a spiritual booster right there. And sitting right here is the lady who runs that chapel. She's the, she's the coordinator. If you ever want to get details, I'm going to put your hand up. So you, she, she'll, tell, she'll tell you how to partake of it. And we all know you're busy. I'm busy. Sometimes it's five minutes. And what he can do in five minutes to each one of us is awesome. I want to close, getting close to my time, I want to read a little short, short scripture. And being, coming from farming and loving it, it always, I know, what it, I know exactly what this scripture is saying. This is from the Luke. Look, this is something else. Don't get far from this Bible. It's a Catholic Bible, you know. We put the Bible together. So what everybody, I mean, that's another time, but nobody else put that Bible together. We put it together. So we have the right to interpret it correctly. Let me take you to Luke. This is chapter 9, verse 62. And he's talking, Jesus is talking. He says, Jesus answered him, whoever puts his hand to the plow but keeps looking back is unfit for the reign of God. That is so true, especially right now. If all, any of y'all in here know farming at all, you know that, especially when you're plowing. With well, sugarcane in particular, when you're plowing, so, uh, soybeans too, but sugarcane is so noticeable. Because when you build a row in sugarcane farming, you're building it for three or four years. So you got to live with that. you got to live with that for three or four years. When you turn into the field, you look all the way at the other end of the field and you put your eyes focused on a tree or a piece of grass or something at the end of that road. And I don't care what you hit while you plow in that field, you never ever look back. You always keep your eye focused on that item. And when you get to the end of the row, then you can look back and your row is straight as an arrow. Your body seems to adjust for all the wet ground and the hard ground and straight as an arrow. But should you lose confidence and look back, when you get to the end of that row and you look back, you know what you see? You see a jog. And so I want to leave you with this in your mind today. 
of what I've talked about for a few minutes. All this is available to you in that church right there, through that priest in your parish right now. I want to lead the waves on both sides of us right now. They're stormy waves on the left and on the right. And they're not going to get, they're not going to calm down. They're going to get more stormy. But remember, keep your eye focused on who? Jesus. Don't look at the waves on the left. Don't look at the waves on the right. Don't pay attention to them to the best of your God-given grace abilities. Stay focused on him. Because that's where the power is. And the waves will deal with them. Remember when Peter looked at Jesus, what did he do? He walked on the water. When he took his eyes off of Jesus, what happened? He sunk. And so today, I want to close in saying, stay focused on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on him. You're going to meet him face to face. There's going to be a face to face meeting with Jesus in about 15 minutes. He's there every time, but as I said, in your parish, he's there waiting in that little tabernacle, waiting in that little tabernacle at the chapel. So thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, spend the time I did. I think it's about time for me to be wrapping up. I, I want to thank you for that. I enjoyed seeing you all. Maybe I'll see you again one day. If I don't ever see you again, out of what I spoke about, Remember, body, blood, soul, and divinity, Eucharist, confession, stay focused on Jesus who is in that Eucharist. Amen? Bye-bye, y'all. Thank you, Paul. Just stand and close with prayer. Ms. Tommy, did you have anything? Your heart just to remind us. Look, if anybody wants a card from our website, I got I got a few here today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. We greet you and pray glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If anybody want, I have a website. If anybody would like to see more about some of this stuff, you get a card from me. I'll be glad. I'll, just, I'll tell you what, I'll, I, you can reach me. I'm the only one on it. So I'll be happy 